Okay, welcome back. We have something more interesting than coffee coming after this panel. Uh, we have the, uh, the misfortune to be the last, but then that's also an opportunity to be very brief and to finish early. Uh, we have a very interesting and diverse group here and we'll be addressing, as we were talking just before the beginning of this panel, we'll be addressing citizen rights from very different perspectives. Um, and as you, uh, as we have just discussed before the coffee break, there are so many practical aspects of it. Some of them not visible, not uh, recognized, for example, as somebody mentioned in the media, uh, not immediately known to European citizens, but things which are affecting every, their uh, everyday lives. I can't uh, uh, stop myself from sharing with you an example of how something which is considered the typical EU bureaucratic shortcoming has become a strong uh, asset for a civil society organization. And an example that I uh, came across in Copenhagen, I don't know if you, if you have seen this restaurant in the old town, which is given to, to an NGO, um, and it uses only the food access, access. So these famous cucumbers which have the wrong shape, uh, these ugly looking carrots, all of that which has to be thrown away because the EU directives don't allow it to be sold, which is of course not true, but it's a part of the, myth of the mythology of, uh, of the European Union. So this Danish NGO um, has signed a contract with some of the big chains that, that sell vegetables and food across, uh, across Copenhagen, and they receive for free all that stuff to cook with. And uh, apart from, uh, from the chef, everybody else in the kitchen is a volunteer. So you can sign up and there is a long waiting list of, uh, of volunteers to be waiters for a day, or a bartender for a day, or a wash disher for a day, who knows. Uh, so something which comes uh, at no cost to the NGO and is sold at the regular, quite, quite serious Danish uh, restaurant prices, uh, and all the, ref uh, all the revenues go to, to a charity which uh, helps uh, migrants, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it's the Danish Refugee Council, actually, the organization which is running the restaurant. So I think, I thought that was a very inventive idea of a, of a social enterprise, could we call it a social enterprise? Mm -hmm. A social enterprise which benefits from the negative mythology of the EU and uh, this uh, typical <laughs> wrong-shaped cucumber, <laughs> and an ugly, an ugly tomato, an ugly carrot, and so on. So, uh, this panel is about how citizen organizations in different countries approach such issues with, as, as social entrepreneurship, and how can civic engagement and social entrepreneurship contribute to tapping the potential of EU citizens. And uh, we have participants uh, uh, from, from Spain, from Albania, from civil society Europe, from uh, youth, uh, the young European federalists, and from the Future Lab. We start with Aida Barquero, who is the project manager of Fundación Ciudadanía. Sorry. Uh, they are a uh, new impact partner part of, the, of, of this current project, and they had a very interesting, I think, initiative and debate on, on civic education, including uh, a panel which I was very much interested in, which was about media literacy and the way media can, can uh, undermine, or poor understanding of the media can undermine uh, civil engagement. So, Aida, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, good afternoon again. Well, it is a pleasure for us, for Fundación Ciudadanía, to participate in uh, the final conference of uh, U-Impact. Thanks to, as Petco and Asha uh, explained this morning, thanks to this great project, we were able to organize nine great national webinars. And as Petco just uh, said, the Spanish U event was uh, held in January in uh, Mérida, Spain where Fundación Ciudadanía is based. 
And uh, we enjoyed a fabulous uh, debate. Among others, we discussed the importance of linking formal and non-formal educational activities at uh, universities and schools. Just following that idea that I introduced uh, and in the, as a member of the public, in order to promote that citizen participation that um, we, we are looking for. Well, for instance, through our Estonian partner, we discovered an example of non-formal educational activity promoted by Estonian high schools and universities. The Arvemus Festival, the Opinion Festival of Estonia, which takes place every summer. The Opinion Festival is a place to exchange ideas on the organization of society, to get fresh ideas and new insights. Well, the most interesting uh, part of, uh, of that is uh, now Fundación Ciudadanía and our Cypriot partner, the Cypriot partner of U Impact, are preparing um, in, uh, in, in our countries, in uh, Cyprus and, um, and Cyprus and in Spain, a similar festival. So in that way, transfer of knowledge works. I mean, these uh, European projects is uh, are just a little piece and um, the thing is that if we if we work hard, uh, we can uh, take that that shared ideas from our partners and uh, and we can try to do them in uh, in our countries. And uh, as Petko said, now uh, in this panel, um, we'll uh, we'll also uh, I'm I'm going to talk about the social entrepreneurs. I'll bring some uh, Spanish experiences. Well, we already had the opportunity to listen to the interesting uh, idea of Carles Cervera, of that uh, kind of social entrepreneur project. And um, following that educational tool, uh, that, uh, that non-formal educational tool, I would like to share with you Facil Lectura uh, in, uh, in English, Easy Reading was born through an employment uh, shuttle and solidarity venture that was targeted at uh, women, young women. Uh, well, most of them unemployed young women. And um, uh, that, that employment shuttle was promoted by my organization, by Fundación Ciudadanía. And uh, in it participated uh, three young women who now they they are partners in a social cooperative called Dile Lectura Facil, uh, Easy Reading. And I, I would like, and I like to add for everyone, Easy Reading, Reading for everyone. Well, which is the aim of this project? So as you more or less can guess, is to create a more sustainable and inclusive, inclusive society and opportunities for everyone. By meeting the needs of people with disabilities, and or at risk of social exclusion. Well, so why do we need that service? Because as Petko said, sometimes we need that volunteers, that people to cover that lack of, uh, of participation by um, our institutions and governments. Well, just to, to share with you some figures, about 30% of the population of the EU population have uh, reading difficulties. Access to reading is a social necessity and a right recognized, uh, as all of, all of us know, by various national and international legal texts, uh, such as uh, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities of the United Nations. And well, and of course, uh, in terms of uh, leisure, reading is a pleasure for sharing ideas, thoughts, and experiences. And well, all of us have that right. Uh, so this uh, project uh, wants to support the special uh, educational needs. The program is addressed to people with disabilities, immigrants, people with limited access to formal education, and people who suffer communication uh, disorders. So, as we said, formal and non-formal education can work together. In fact, they need to work together, and we don't have to see that as a... Um, extra activity that, well, you can do if you have time, they, they need to, to work together. And uh, just as a kind of reivindication, um, 
not everything is positive because well we had that great idea of that social cooperative that came from um, that uh, employment uh, shuttle and but the thing is that only five percent of all published books in uh, the developed countries are ever produced in accessible formats so for us for uh, i mean from Ciencia, in fundacion ciudadanía and for all this partnership of u impact it produces a profound indignation that seven EU member states have formed a minority bloc which is impeding the process of ratifying the, the Treaty of Marrakech that um, is, uh, is in, what it wants is to, is to change that reality, to, um, to make public all these uh, different formats. Because the thing is that all materials and resources built by <laughs> that uh, by Lectura Facil, but that social uh, cooperative, are uh, following the guide some guidelines based on uh, the International Federation of Library Association and Institutions. Well, but however, all these efforts will not have the desired impact without the support of uh, EU institutions. The thing is that we cannot demand a participatory citizenship if uh, the institutions uh, don't provide citizens with uh, the right tools. So uh, that little reivindication that we make from here is that, well, we would like to know how the EU institutions intend to make good the EU obligations under uh, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities by promptly, by promptly uh, removing the unnecessary obstacles uh, to ratificate uh, for the ratification of that treaty of Marrakech treaty because well uh, the thing is that if we have good ideas but we don't have uh, more support from EU institutions we cannot get that EU impact that real impact that we are looking for and uh, just uh, the, another example of social and entrepreneurs uh, projects in, in Spain is participation, innovation and social uh, entrepreneurship for local development. Well, in Spanish is participación, innovación, emprendimiento social, which forms PS, uh, that means fit in, in Spanish. So it's a kind of uh, the slogan, the idea is a kind of fit to keep on walking, to keep on walking by transforming uh, uh, lives in towns. Uh, uh, the Badajoz Provincial Council launches a pilot project in order to promote innovation and social entrepreneurship and the objective is to achieve a local uh, development that promotes the creation of social entrepreneurs and well through a team of experts uh, that is coordinated by Fundación Ciudadanía. Two last minutes Aida. Well, I'll, uh, I'll get there, I'll get there. And well, just to, to share with you, the, uh, the aim of that project is to encourage new young graduates to create job opportunities in the rural environment, because uh, the thing is that we need to transform uh, the lives in, uh, in, the, in the countryside. The program is supported by public and private entities that seek to construct social innovation and ecosystems. And well, just an example, we'd like to bring the experience of a young participant who after studying a master's in organic farming developed the idea of creating social organic gardens. And uh, well, he, he told us that thanks to agro, agroecology, uh, we can now join the ancient techniques because we don't have to forget what works well. We don't need to change everything and um, of planting along with the modern techniques. In, from, in Fundación Ciudadana we are creating an informative manual just to encourage new uh, entrepreneurs to follow, to, to, be par to be part of the second edition of this, uh, of this uh, kind of shuttle em uh, employment. And well, just, uh, just to, to show um, some of our partners are in Exos, Social and Tech. There is also um, an NGO called Cambiar el Mundo, which, which helps that young social entrepreneurs. And uh, well, as uh, the aim of this panel was also to, uh, 
well, to introduce some EU tools that we could use. We had a nice experience with Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs, which is an, a good instrument to, for that young entrepreneurs that are, they, they feel a bit alone in their countries. They can, uh, they can collaborate with, uh, with experienced uh, entrepreneurs from other EU countries. And in that way, I think that that uh, is a kind of they receive a kind of grant, and um, through through that they can uh, they can be in that in that uh, be in, in that experienced uh, company for uh, six uh, eight months, and uh, through that uh, they can uh, they can get that confidence that someone that sometimes there is a lack of confidence, and they can get that confidence and build that social uh, entrepreneurships because sometimes if being an entrepreneur is difficult sometimes being social a social entrepreneur is even more difficult so it's a kind of uh, of tool to encourage them so thank you for your time and just to a kind of positive message we have to remember that we don't have to dream our life and uh, we can be so let's let's be creative. Let's be so social entrepreneurs and uh, live our dreams. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ida. Just, uh, just one second. The thing is that I have to fly because I have a flight to to catch, and now we know the the controls that are there are more controls. Uh, and we now after I mean after this panel, we're uh, we're gonna show uh, um, with. Uh, that uh, we have the, the, these great uh, photographs that show us the, some examples of citizen participation. You can see all of them in this uh, in this room. And um, uh, besides that, we have uh, some videos from uh, I mean all all uh, U Impact partners uh, shared some videos that could help us to describe what is citizen participation and from. Uh, from Spain, we want to share three videos. In one of them, you'll see. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm providing you with that uh, description, just um, just to be sure that you'll um, more or less follow that uh, that uh, video uh, story. Well, you you'll see several uh, volunteers from my hometown, Gandia, which is in the is located in the south of Valencia. And uh, well, it is related to the refugees in Syria. Uh, last month, uh, some volunteers from my hometown traveled to Idomeni to give the clothes and food collected through a campaign that was organized by some local and regional associations. And uh, this is a kind of, you'll see there is a kind of video to say thanks to for all of that effort, that local and regional efforts. And um, well, you will see how volunteers are introducing all the material collected into a container, and uh, it is a short video. And then you'll see you'll see how two weeks after the container arrives to Idomeni, it was in April, and volunteers distribute um, that materials among the, the refugees. And they are nice videos, and yeah, especially because they show a very nice volunteer job. And um, the last one is uh, related to El 15M, the Spanish Revolution. Uh, just five years uh, later, uh, you see that uh, you know that this uh, movement is still alive. And uh, in this video shows well a fact that it started five years ago. Uh, it, it is called a, it is the Spanish Spring, and uh, los indignados, the outraged uh, citizens who saw the, a political and economical change, well, uh, they gathered together in assemblies and spontaneous assemblies at the streets, in public squares, in order to demand uh, a change. And uh, well, five years later, we are <laughs> still looking for that change, and that's why this movement is still alive. And we think that it is a nice, uh, a nice example. And well, there are English subtitles, so the message will <laughs> will arrive to all of you. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of uh, the afternoon. Thank you, Ida. <laughs> Ariola Agol is Director of Programs at Partners Albania for Change and Development and 
their debate, their issues was also re were also related to social enterprises. So, Ariola, the floor is yours. Thank you, Petko. Uh, Marta, please, C can you? Hello, everybody. My name is Ariola, as Petko uh, already introduced me. I work as the director of programs for Partners Albania. is a is an Albanian organization, Local One. Uh, but we are member of uh, of a bigger uh, network, of a global network of 20 centers all around the, the globe, which mission is the the advancements of society uh, in the uh, countries in in transition. This was also the aim of the uh, of the organizations when we uh, uh, founded it in 2001, and uh, our main uh, uh, area of work uh, since that uh, that time. And uh, uh, to nowadays is uh, related to increase uh, citizen participation in decision making and policy making and uh, create uh, more access and uh, a more enabling environment for civil society organizations uh, in order uh, for the country to be more uh, democratic and uh, uh, governed better. Uh, in this uh, framework, uh, in the last years, uh, we have uh, been working. Uh, uh, very much on uh, uh, not only for capacity building of the civil society organizations and uh, legal uh, framework, uh, but also for the uh, to support these uh, 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 organizations, but uh, also uh, groups of citizens uh, in uh, in their uh, initiatives uh, and uh, innovative ideas uh, to create uh, uh, um, social entrepreneurship. Uh, related to the um, not only to this panel but also to the to the panels uh, uh, before, especially to the to the values uh, uh, of uh, European citizenship. Uh, although Albania is not a, a EU country, but we are just a candidate, and uh, it was a great pleasure that we participated together with the partners uh, in the EU Impact Project. Uh, I can say that the experience was was great, and uh, we had the opportunity to exchange uh, many ideas and uh, also our experiences uh, as candidate country uh, with other EU member country. And I think this is an added value for the project because uh, it uh, uh, the all the the national debates, uh, uh, the one in Albania, but also the three ones that. We participated uh, in uh, and contributed with uh, with our uh, experiences uh, were were broadcasted and uh, they were uh, followed by many citizens and uh, uh, this was an opportunity for them to uh, listen, let's say, to uh, to other experiences and to have uh, uh, to to know uh, about uh, other countries which are uh, EU countries. Uh, how uh, the EU uh, values uh, and the EU uh, access in uh, rights in uh, labor market, etc., uh, is developed uh, throughout the throughout the years. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Partners Albania is working since uh, some years uh, for the social entrepreneurship development uh, in Albania, and uh, we are uh, working through uh, different, let's say, uh, forms. Uh, one form is uh, through seed funding support for uh, startups uh, of uh, uh, civil society organizations or active local citizens in local communities, especially in communities uh, uh, where uh, marginalized groups uh, are living and uh, want to change their, their life. Uh, we are working through exchanges and cooperation among organizations and entrepreneurs, investors, and uh, uh, private sector at national and international le le uh, level uh, through, let's say, uh, uh, involving uh, these organizations and uh, the people who created the social entrepreneurship in uh, different uh, conferences, uh, international uh, forums and debates in order to give them a chance uh, to share their experience but also to learn from, from the others. Uh, we are working uh, uh, also for the facilitation of the dialogue with the state actors because uh, in Albania uh, recently uh, also uh, because we are a candidate country and uh, uh, the government wants to fulfill uh, a set of uh, you know legal framework and criteria they want to establish a very but very with rush uh, laws and everything in order to to, to fulfill the, the criteria and this is not very 
uh, very good and very healthy uh, because if it is not done with the uh, with the citizen participation and uh, with the uh, if it's not done with a uh, let's say a consultation of local groups which have experiences in this uh, uh, in these things, uh, then uh, it can be really a mess. And uh, this is also the case uh, recently in, in Albania, where the government is uh, starting uh, to introduce uh, uh, a law on social entrepreneurship and uh, will uh, pass it soon uh, in the parliament. Even though we are really in, in the first step of this uh, uh, of this development. And we really need not to have laws that limit, but uh, laws that gives more uh, access and more liberty to uh, uh, these new uh, entities to be to be to be developed. And uh, yeah, and uh, I will. How is it Spanish? Yeah? Okay. Okay, uh, uh, I'm going quickly just to show you some of the, um, uh, uh, in, in doing so, because uh, we try to, to act as professionals, uh, we did uh, lots of research uh, on social entrepreneurship uh, initiatives uh, in Albania, and then uh, we continued with some education uh, and awareness campaign, and uh, as I told you, with capacity building and financial support. Uh, we, uh, we, are part of uh, several networks, uh, including the Social Innovation uh, Europe platform, and uh, we have been part of um, uh, different, uh, uh, let's say, projects at the European level, trying, uh, as I, uh, 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 as I uh, already told you, uh, to uh, bring new experiences and models in Albania, and to educate uh, these, uh, to, to educate the people and the. Uh, to, to bring a, a European mentality of how the things uh, are functioning in the EU countries. So for us, it's more easy to uh, see these models and to adapt them uh, based, on, uh, based on our experience. Um, I don't know, this is not mm? Some. Okay, I'm yeah, please. There, okay. You, you pass? Yeah. Again, mm -hmm. you pass again. Okay. And again. And again, okay. Uh, I just wanted to introduce to you some of the uh, social entrepreneurship and then everything is uh, also in our website, uh, just to give you the uh, one idea of uh, um, uh, what we have been doing so far. Uh, from four years uh, in the framework of uh, national competition and also regional one, because it's also organized at, uh, at the Balkans level, we are organizing a, a green uh, ideas competition. Uh, it is an annual competition that aims to serve as an incubator for small-scale green and social economic development ideas, uh, utilizing local resources and uh, revitalizing tradition of production uh, of community. And every year, uh, people from local community or civil society organizations are competing uh, with innovative ideas uh, and uh, uh, the criteria are that the ideas uh, should be social, so uh, the impact, uh, sh they, ha they should have a social impact, but also should be uh, environmental friendly. And uh, some of the uh, uh, best ideas, and I have to mention, and you can find uh, further on, is, can you please, the next, uh, is designed by PANA. Uh, is a is a furnishing uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, the uh, architects that uh, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, initiated this uh, this uh, let's say uh, social entrepreneurship uh, do furniture for home, bar, restaurants, and offices through recycling of wooden pallets. And uh, the today uh, they started with two people, and today they have uh, 12 employees. In, uh, in three years, and uh, all the employees are people uh, coming out from uh, orphanages after uh, they, they uh, 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 after the 18, uh, or uh, uh, the uh, pensioners or return uh, immigrants. Other uh, very interesting uh, social entrepreneurship, the next one, is Albania Recycling Community, where uh, a Roma community uh, is organized uh, to, uh, uh, let's say, recycle uh, uh, everything, and they do the, the collection uh, with bicycles in order to be uh, environmental uh, friendly. The next, please. Uh, yeah, and uh, the, and there is uh, uh, another one, which is the Girocastra Foundation, uh, aiming to, uh, 
to let's say develop further the uh, the traditions uh, in Albania for handicrafts or for other things that women uh, un unemployed women can can make and can contribute uh, to the uh, let's say to the community and to the tradition and to tourism development. Uh, this uh, foundation, uh, uh, together with local community, uh, started a, a social enterprise, with uh, and they employed uh, about uh, 12 uh, uh, women and girls uh, in poor condition, uh, in poor living condition. I just wanted to end it up with some uh, uh, because we are working a lot also in the uh, awareness and uh, uh, the next one, please, and the next. Okay, uh, we work a lot with the. Uh, as I told you, with advocacy uh, uh, on the issues that we are working on. And uh, uh, we organized uh, for the education of uh, the government, uh, but also of the other stakeholders. We organized in the last four years uh, 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 many debates on social entrepreneurship development in order to bring uh, international experiences, but also to uh, uh, to suggest to the government what, what are the best models and uh, how the uh, they should, let's say, uh, support further the social entrepreneurship uh, through the, uh, as I uh, uh, already told you, through uh, not imposing a law which is very strict, but a law which is uh, more open and uh, to discuss the law uh, before with the people and uh, uh, with local communities and organizations who are already uh, working uh, uh, in this area. And uh, uh, of course, there is a uh, because uh, social entrepreneurship is uh, is in the focus of many EU programs and uh, projects. Uh, is very uh, good uh, to coordinate uh, with the uh, international donors, but also agencies and uh, uh, civil society organizations in the country to uh, in order to uh, further develop these initiatives that uh, brings uh, citizens more closely to. Uh, the access uh, uh, in decision-making, but also in economic empowerment. Thank you. Thank you, Ariola. Uh, for, for any uh, further, uh, please, the, the last slide, please. The last. Okay, these are my contacts, and uh, Partners Albania is uh, the organization, and uh, we have a very updated website where everything is, uh, is written down there. Thank you. And all the links will be on the EU Impact website, which is uimpact.net. Uh, thank you, Ariel. I think it's very, it's very nice to be reminded every now and then, uh, among other things, about the transformative power of the EU, something that we sometimes forget, discussing other problems that we are facing with every day. But uh, uh, Albania, and something that Flora touched upon uh, during the previous panel, countries further away from, from the EU are looking at the EU including from the perspective of rights as an example and it's good to remember that the EU still has this great transformative power as a driver of change of positive change across the world okay and now we go to uh, Carlotta Besozzi she's a um, uh, coordinator for civil society Europe and will be speaking about the civic space mapping in the EU yes uh, thank you very much uh, so first of all a very quick word about the civil society Europe so Civil Society Europe is uh, an organization which was born out of the European Year of uh, Citizenship and out of the alliance that was formed. And uh, it, it includes uh, civil society organizations that work on uh, citizenship, fundamental rights, uh, social rights, uh, uh, culture, development, uh, environment, and youth, and, and so on. And uh, uh, actually, I'm also here because uh, ECAS is uh, one of our founding members and also active uh, in, uh, in the steering committee. And I'm going to present a part of the work that we do as a very new organization. Uh, so we are working on uh, the recognition of civil society organizations. Uh, we are working on, uh, on civic space and we are working on the implementation of uh, civil dialogue in the EU, and notably about Article 11, uh, beyond the ECI, really the, the part around the civil dialogue, uh, which is um, often a bit neglected uh, by the EU institution. So I will just um, present this survey on civic space, which was the result of the work 
uh, which is done by one of our working groups on civic space and uh, fundamental rights. And we worked in cooperation with Civicus to prepare this survey, which is actually uh, was an online survey, uh, which was launched and addressed to association and activists in the EU, but also uh, accession uh, countries, European economic area. And uh, it was uh, based on the national level. So national association could respond to this survey. And uh, it was very quick. It was done in two months. So it's a first attempt. And what the survey aims to look at is really uh, to have a sort of perception about civic space from this organization. So it's not uh, nothing scientific. It's really how uh, how people active either in organization or in uh, in civic space perceive the situation in uh, in Europe. And so we had uh, quite a lot of interest despite a few months, but we had 180 full responses, which were good because there, there were also a lot of open um, responses to questions and around uh, 20, 20 questions. And uh, we, we, had, um, we had answers from all the countries, but some countries in the, in the EU, but some countries only a few. And uh, we uh, got higher responses from Hungary, uh, Slovenia, and France. We had a good uh, share of, I mean, uh, was gender balanced. <laughs> and then we had uh, also um, a good, um, uh, it doesn't, yeah, you can see that also age-wise it is, it is quite balanced. Um, so basically, the organization that responded were in very different fields of civil society, and uh, most of them were active at national level. I mean, all national organizations, but some of them were, for example, uh, active also at international level. And uh, you could also see that most of the organization had a more limited uh, uh, more limited budget to operate, although there were uh, a few organizations who even had uh, over one million and even a very few over uh, five uh, million uh, dollars turnover. Basically, uh, there were a number of questions about civic space, about the health of democracy and so on, you will see. So I will go through them. And we can see, for example, as regard the conditions for uh, civil society and citizen action, that actually respondents are very much divided. So they were asked to assess the conditions in the last year, and you had 40% more or less which think that the conditions were not so good, were below average, and 40% uh, which exactly the same amount which were uh, above the average. and or 20% which are around the, the status quo. And actually what I noticed is that there was quite a difference uh, between Western and Eastern European countries in this respect. Um, there were questions about the condition for registration of associations, freedom of assembly and freedom of expression, which in general are quite positive. Um, they are, but the only thing, freedom of expression, they were around almost a third who expressed uh, concern. There was a question about ability and willingness of the state to investigate abuses, abuses against the civil society organization sector, and over 40% considered that this was not so good, and, and, and actually there were quite a few on the, on the, on the average. And uh, also a big worry is about financial support. So you have only 18% of respondents which consider that financial support for civil society is actually enough. And as I mentioned before, the perception changes between Western and Eastern Europe. And this is just a slide about the financial support to give you an idea. In terms of civil dialogue, uh, there was, uh, the questions were around the civic space at local and regional and national level. And we could see that the satisfaction de decreases as, as, as far as the level increases, so at national level 
and regional level is definitely lower, where uh, local level there is uh, quite some satisfaction. And also, and, um, CSO felt uh, very important to cooperate at European level. It's a very huge response. Um, there were also a number of questions about what is the, uh, the top issue of concern around civic space for organizations. So they are the two um, most important worries are funding restrictions and lack of adequate consultation processes, which come, these are the <coughs> number organizations could actually rank from first to, uh, to, to eighth, and actually on the first, uh, on the, as a top issue and second top issues, funding restriction and lack of adequate consultation processes come very strong. If you look at the younger participants, it's reversed order. And what comes also as a third issue uh, is uh, in all, uh, by all um, respondents is contract conditionality and then followed very closely by uh, counter-terrorism measures. So although as a first issue, they are, uh, they are lower. And other issues that were mentioned by respondents was also the lack of uh, civil society organization recognitions, the increasing social exclusion and discrimination, and also the threats by extremist groups. <coughs> Two minutes reminder. Yeah, so they were almost <coughs> done. So the other issues related to the health of democracy in Europe, and what is positive is that over 60% consider that democratic principles are upheld in their country, although there was a variation from country to country. And that, but uh, there were worries around access to government information that confirm uh, uh, the answer to the questions before. So people see in the last year either a status quo or worsening of the situation. And the same goes uh, for the identification and reporting of uh, corruption. Um, there was also a question on how you forecast for the future uh, civic space in Europe. And actually, as you can see, uh, there is a tendency for decline of the situation of civic space in Europe. And I will just conclude with this slide. So, uh, which was the issue of political uh, trends in Europe. Uh, so you have 84% of respondents which uh, see an increase in nationalism and discrimination against uh, immigrants and ethnic minorities as a result of uh, recent events like the refugee crisis. And also 63% uh, agree that recent political developments have increased polarization between different sections of society. And uh, also 73.5% um, uh, 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 consider that the support of the government to civil society in terms of promoting human rights and democratic values is not enough. And uh, over 60% also want the youth to do more to guarantee civic space in, in, their, in their country, which was uh, basically the findings of this survey. Uh, we are also uh, looking at some uh, case studies. We will have a full report uh, uh, later in, uh, in June, but this was, uh, was just to give you the idea. Again, it's, not, uh, it's nothing scientific, but it's a perception and uh, which, which is interesting to, to see. And uh, we'll certainly, I mean, work on it uh, and uh, refine it uh, uh, in, a, in a further year. And uh, hopefully we'll also have, uh, have more respondents in order to, to, to make it uh, more, uh, more solid. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> now we move to a very interesting issue. Uh, in my country, which is not a member of Schengen, Bulgaria, uh, there is a vast majority, I think something like 65, 70% of the population want Bulgaria to join the Schengen, to become a part of the Schengen area, which is slightly less the, than the percentage of people who want our borders closed for refugees. So <laughs> we are in this 
dual personality, you know, um, disorder. And uh, this is why I think it's um, it's quite uh, it's quite refreshing to see somebody who says Schengen is mine and I want to keep it. <laughs> so this is an intro to our next speaker, who is Yuan Bukura, Secretary General of the Young European Federalists. He's going to talk about the campaign "Don't Touch My Schengen." Yes. Uh, Thank you very much for having us here in this uh, uh, panel um, and for already introducing, I can uh, already say a bit about uh, myself. Uh, being as a, Rom a Romanian myself, I f can fully relate to what, what, <laughs> what you said, uh, based at least on uh, what our civil society organizations back home think. But here I'm uh, in uh, my quality as a European and as a federalist to present our campaign. Uh, don't touch my Schengen. Before I'll go to don't touch my Schengen, I'll just briefly say a few words about the Young European Federalists. The Young European Federalists are the oldest pro-European youth movement um, uh, in Europe with uh, uh, member sections in over 33 countries uh, and over 30,000 uh, uh, members. Now, and coming specifically to this uh, uh, don't touch my Schengen campaign. Now, what we're experiencing at the moment is what we like to call and label as a multiple crisis. Uh, we all know that what started off as a financial crisis turned to into a social crisis and then later on uh, we have the, the, the current migration and refugee crisis, which sparked um, heads of state to, to actually want to, to uh, suspend the Schengen Agreement. Um, what we then thought is that Schengen itself is one of the most important pillars that we've uh, experienced historically in European integration. Uh, we didn't want to, Schengen has brought us so many things in terms of, just to give a, a brief um, example, um, back in the day when you've, you've taken, you would take a, uh, a Finn uh, and telling him that, or her, that they would actually be able to reside in Portugal and open their, their company or go to studies there or whatever they wanted to do just to move and move freely across the continent, that was not possible. Now, the Young European Federalists uh, militated for, for, for uh, free movement long before the Schengen Agreement was even in place and long before free movement was actually even available uh, um, for Europeans, for the regular European citizen. Now, um, coming upon the Don't Touch My Schengen campaign itself, um, it had uh, three different pillars, so to speak, or three different dimensions. One of them was a huge online campaign which was enabled through um, a Thunderclap. Uh, I think some of you, or maybe most of you, have heard about Thunderclap, um, which enables users to uh, sign simultaneously with their Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr account to have a specific message sent. So that was uh, uh, made for a specific date and hour and then it went viral online to, uh, to, to catch the eye and the attention about the importance of having the Schengen Agreement up and running. Uh, needless to say, um, and coming back to the very first point um, that was mentioned by our moderator here, uh, it's quite of a paradox that especially in member states of the EU that are not in Schengen, and by that we mean Bulgaria and Romania that really want to be in Schengen but are against the current wave of, uh, of refugees. That also strikes another point that the, the, uh, the, the young European federalists stay for and that stand for, and that's a, a common security and defense mechanism with full respect, however, to asylum seekers and uh, human rights and dignity. Now, Coming back to the Don't Touch My Schengen, the second point was a letter which was signed by us and by 18 other pan-European youth NGOs. Not only the um, uh, young European Federalists signed that letter, that letter was addressed to, to uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, that letter was addressed uh, to uh, Donald Tusk and to Martin Schulz. Um, and we were happy that uh, the three presidents actually reacted and replied to a response that they are aware of this and that, that the actions that are being taken are, are uh, uh, here uh, um, basically um, uh, they're very aware, uh, well aware of this issue and they're trying to do their best to keep the, the heads of, uh, of the member states uh, to, to respect the accord and uh, 
keep the Schengen Agreement alive. Um, another thing that this has touched upon basically was the fact that this was commonly signed also by the biggest youth platform, which is the European Youth Forum, but it was also signed by all the party political or by most, the vast majority of the party political youth organizations. So Jeff Europe as a, a non-partisan youth NGO, we are a political NGO because we stand for European federalism, but we're not party political. Um, but we managed to put to, to make the conservatives, the socialists, the liberals and the greens to speak together in one voice uh, and call upon the, uh, the, the Schengen Agreement to, to uh, uh, stay in its place. Then uh, here you can see on the Storify, uh, uh, on, the, on the screens that we have here on the walls, uh, basically this is a, um, a sum up of what we did. Uh, here is, for instance, even uh, what, what are, uh, like I said in the beginning of the presentation, our um, um, network has over 33, uh, 32, 33 uh, national sections. Uh, and they all did actions on the ground. So our, uh, all our volunteers actually went on the ground. Here you can see, for instance, uh, when um, Jeff Italy uh, welcomed uh, Matteo Renzi on the island of uh, Ventotene, which has a specific, uh, very special meaning for, for, for us because that's where the uh, uh, Manifesto di Ventotene was written. That's like, uh, that's our Federalist uh, Bible, so to speak, just a small side note. Um, so uh, th those are, as you can see on, on those, those are street actions, for instance, that were treated also by major uh, 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 press groups uh, in Italy, in Germany. In Germany, uh, 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 our section blocked basically a bridge which was connecting Germany to, to Luxembourg. Uh, and they said, look, this is what happens if you suspend the, the Schengen Agreement. You will basically not be able to, you will have to have huge queues and so on. And I have to tell you that the bystanders there and the cars that were queuing to get into Luxembourg and into Germany actually were very thankful for our volunteers that they're doing such an action on the ground because that raises awareness. Um, and yeah, so basically those are the three, uh, the three dimensions that I've been talking about. The, um, uh, the Thunderclap online, uh, which has an, had an outreach of over 1.5 million single users. Then we've had the, the um, uh, common political voice so for the party political youth organizations, the European Youth Forum, and other civil society youth organizations. And then we had a massive on the ground uh, uh, um, Schengen, which here you can see, for instance, in, 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 in Denmark, uh, in, in Germany, in Italy, in Norway. Um, this was in the Czech Republic. Um, and so forth. Um, now, what I can say is that in the end, this had this "Don't Touch My Schengen" campaign has a major has been a major success, at least in terms of showing the importance of direct grassroots approach citizenship that can be done through the means of online tools and online campaigning and acting through your volunteer basis. So this campaign, needless to say, okay, it ha it has been successful in terms of press releases reaching out to politically to the presidents, uh, doing it online. But the real impact was also offline, on the ground, and that has been only manageable due to our volunteer uh, hub. So this also shows the importance of activism, and hereby I will also conclude. And by, by underlining the importance of activism, what I'm saying is that people actually identify with people, with their fellow citizens and, and with what they're doing, and not necessarily with complex treaties, but in order for, for the complex treaties and the mechanisms in which Europe is working and that we can make and have a more democratic uh, and fair and tolerant Europe is through the means of those uh, civil society organizations um, and their actions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we're looking at uh, how to get the young people involved. I understand that this will be one of the major perspectives that will be offered to this debate from um, uh, Claire there. Uh, she's from the Future Lab Europe program, leader of the European Policy Center. The floor is yours. Thank you very much and thank you to ACAS for, um, for the invitation. 
and for organizing this um, important event. So I will speak in my uh, two functions because I'm uh, having two hats at the, at the moment. So I'm uh, a senior policy analyst at the European Policy Center, which is a think tank, an independent think tank based here in, in Brussels, mainly working on employment and, and social affairs. But I'm also the program leader of this uh, Future Lab Europe uh, program. Um, so some of you might uh, know what Future Lab Europe is about, some others uh, don't. So I will just say a couple, a few words about uh, what the main objectives of this um, program are about. Um, so this is a, indeed a program for uh, young uh, Europeans. Um, with the main objective of trying to build a network of young people and trying to promote a debate on the future of Europe among the young generation, but also trying to provide a platform of uh, discussions and uh, exchanges between the young generation and uh, policymakers, including uh, EU leaders. So as part um, of um, this program, so we have a strong focus on uh, the future of uh, democracy and how to increase the participation of young people in societies and in our political uh, system. And as part of our activities this year, so we launched our uh, spring publication some weeks ago, so in um, last month, so in April, um, on um, so called Bring Back uh, the Citizens. And this publication that I don't have with me here, but which is made, uh, which is available on our website, so on the website of Future Lab Europe. So this um, publication is basically a collection of uh, ideas and um, suggestions of young people on how to revive. Um, citizens' interest in democracy and how to uh, reinvent our political system, which is facing um, growing uh, distrust from uh, EU citizens. So my intervention today will shed light on some of the ideas of this publication and put them on the table for debate. Um, but also some, uh, bring some additional ideas and move away a bit from the focus of this um, panel discussion, which is on uh, social entrepreneurship, but trying to touch upon other aspects of EU citizenship. So to start with, um, I would like to share some observations uh, with you. Uh, so we are certainly all aware of uh, some uh, common developments across uh, the EU, but we still, I think, in Brussels ten, tend to um, forget some of them uh, because we are uh, kind of in our bubble and uh, um, in contact with a lot of uh, people working in the EU institutions. But sometimes we don't um, realize um, so the difficulties uh, on the ground and the realities on the ground. So um, one of the uh, key observations is that there is this growing uh, disconnect between uh, citizens uh, and their representatives. Um, and that's something that is to be seen, I think, uh, in every part of uh, Europe. So we are um, seeing all these uh, new political parties, the emergence of these uh, new political uh, forces. And uh, some commentators have even um, talked about uh, the crisis of uh, Western uh, democracies. I think that um, this is due for um, this is due to, to several reasons. Um, first of all, some uh, economic developments, uh, s the fact that uh, there have been some uh, losers and winners. Um, as a result of globalization, as a result of uh, changes on the labor market. Um, we see also that inequality um, is growing in most of the, of the, of the member states and that um, the redistribution um, uh, function of our member state is not as efficient as, uh, as before. Um, and when we look at um, survey, we see that um, this young generation is the first generation who believe that they won't be better off than uh, the generation of their uh, parents. So they don't really believe in, 
in social progress uh, anymore. Besides economic reasons, we also see that there are some political uh, reasons, that there is a growing distrust uh, towards politics, towards uh, mainstream political parties, and we see the emergence of um, anti-establishment forces, uh, mass citizens' movements, so of course some of them are stronger in, in, in uh, some countries than others, uh, but it's still uh, a common a trend uh, across uh, Europe. So this distrust is not really specific to the EU or to EU institutions or to the EU uh, political model. Um, it's really happening all across, uh, all across uh, Europe, but there are some similarities uh, in this movement. And one of the similarities is that um, most of the cases, in most of the cases, so young people are the core group of these, um, of these uh, movements. Um, so I wouldn't really say that uh, civic engagement is uh, disappearing uh, across Europe because we see that young people are still very um, engaged in public debates, so are calling on governments, institutions to uh, listen to their voice. Um, it's very important for them to uh, debate ideas and, um, yeah, they are, want to engage to shape uh, their own uh, uh, future. Um, but uh, what is a reality, I think, is that the form that civic engagement uh, has taken over, over recent years has changed. So it's not um, really civic engagement through trade unions or through... Uh, traditional organizations, it's uh, more civic engagement by taking to the streets or being involved uh, in uh, public uh, debates uh, online. And I think that the EU also has um, uh, to take uh, its role in this change and has to adjust, adjust to, to these uh, changes. So, but how What's, what's the issue and what does it, um, how does it relate I mean, to the topic of today and to the topic of EU citizenship? Um, I think that we have to remind ourselves that um, first, um, by introducing EU citizenship, so EU leaders wanted to promote the um, idea of uh, having a European identity because they considered it, the, the, the fact that having a European identity would be a kind of precondition for uh, supporting the, the European project. But when we look at the reality and uh, how this idea has been implemented on the ground, so we see that there is a kind of contradiction or there is a kind of dichotomy between uh, what um, EU leaders want to promote and then uh, the implementation on the ground. So just to take an example, uh, when we look at uh, the debate about uh, Brexit and what the UK is uh, negotiating, so we see that there is a questioning of some of the key principles of the EU, like for instance the freedom of movement or um, the uh, anti-discrimination uh, principle based on, on, uh, on nationality. Um, I also think that um, one of the reasons is also the absence of uh, any European public uh, space, of, um, of any European public uh, sphere. Um, what we see, and looking again at these uh, mass citizens' movements, we see that uh, most of these, that civic engagement most of the time is happening at either the local or the national level, so that these movements are really constrained by um, national boundaries, so they focus on national issues and they don't really go cross-border. Although I have again to uh, to repeat and to recognize that there are some similarities uh, in these um, in these movements, uh, we also have to recognize that there have been some uh, very important initiatives undertaken by EU institutions to uh, make these EU citizenship a reality. So we can uh, think about the European Citizens Initiative, but also a program like uh, Erasmus uh, Plus. So I think that, um, yeah, we are uh, facing a number of difficulties, of obstacles to make these um, 
EU citizenship a reality. But there are some solutions, and I think that we have to debate also and to put the eyes, some new ideas on, on the table and to include young people in this uh, debate on how to revive and to give sense to EU citizenship. Um, just I'm going to, um, to suggest some, some ideas some for, for, for the debate. Um, some courses of action for, for the future that um, are very important to, to me or that are also considered by young people as uh, a key uh, avenue for reviving this uh, EU citizenship. So first of all, um, and one of the uh, recommendations of this Future Lab Europe program and of our last publication is that we have to uh, create a truly European political culture at the European level, that uh, having this accumulation of national political cultures is not sufficient, that we need really a truly European decision-making process. A second uh, idea will uh, be also to make progress on social policies, and here so I would like also to make the link with the topic of social entrepreneurship, um, because um, I think that um, I mean, social policies and, um, I mean, uh, creating some redistribution at the European level is also a key factor for creating uh, identity and for creating identity at the, at the European level. So I think that there are plenty of instruments that will need uh, to be further explored. So I'm thinking, for instance, here on the uh, unconditional basic uh, income, uh, that could also provide support for young entrepreneurs in Europe uh, and uh, enable them to uh, initiate uh, social projects uh, without worrying about um, how to make uh, these projects, uh, how to make uh, ends uh, meet. Another, another uh, idea would be also to increase, uh, and which is uh, very um, I mean, important if we want uh, the EU to be a, a kind of global setter in uh, democracies to increase the transparency of the decision-making process at the uh, EU level, because uh, still too many decisions are uh, taking behind uh, closed doors. And we also believe, so one of the, of the idea of this report is also that uh, technologies uh, could play a key role uh, in that, in making EU institutions more uh, transparent. And last but not least, I think that uh, it's uh, very important uh, for EU institutions, uh, but also uh, beyond that for the civil society um, to support the emergence of pan-European <coughs> movements. So not only to operate uh, at the national level, but trying to connect, uh, to, to create connections with movements um, across uh, Europe to uh, initi to, to support cross-border initiatives. Um, and here, uh, and uh, I mean, it's one of the uh, difficulties that um, our program is also uh, experiencing, is that we see that um, uh, most of these movements of these cross-border initiatives are uh, limited to um, uh, high educated uh, people, uh, to people who are already familiar with the, uh, with the EU institutions, with how the EU uh, functions. And I think that if we want to uh, revive EU citizenship, we also have to think about, um, I mean, to uh, part of the population who, don't, who doesn't really have access to, um, to education and uh, to how the EU institutions work. So I will uh, stop here because I see that we are already running behind schedule. But uh, thank you for your attention. And um, the report, our publication is uh, available on our website, so don't uh, hesitate to have a look. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the participants in this panel. And uh, please, if you have comments or questions, now is the time. <laughs>
Please, please speak up while I'm changing the pen. Yeah. At the end of the day, so I'm not too sure. I think it was very interesting in terms of civic engagement. And looking at the post, there is some level of civic engagement, although it, it seems to me that it's not directly to uh, the institution and maybe in some member states. Some research done by the Electoral Commission in the UK, which looked at ethnic minorities and why ethnic minorities didn't have the high level of civic engagement. And something was quite interesting, and, and especially in terms of participating in election. And it seems that one of the obstacles was the fact that people believed, especially from ethnic minority, that they had no role to play and that their participation didn't matter because they had no influence in decision making. So we, yes, we can look at different ways of engaging with EU citizens through online media, but bottom line, there needs to be a, a, a clear message that they can influence Brussels. Try, but you, you've got to tell them, look, this is, you know, this is a two-way relationship. Engagement is a two-way, and we can try and get more people to engage, but you need that comeback. Yeah, people are. I would agree with that. People are not interested in in uh, discussing. They are interested in, in in having an impact. And if they see that their efforts are leading nowhere, of course, that's the end of all the efforts. Oh, it does sound. It's the reality. Yeah. Any more questions? Or comments from the comments? Panel? Okay, then I would like to invite Asya Kivrakova to, to say a few words at the end of this uh, long day, and we can move on to the uh, more visual and attractive part of the conference. Um, I'm, I'm very thankful to all of you for participating. I was sharing with, with a colleague that um, I'm, I'm always so happy since I'm in Brussels here for four years already to see people, so many people in the room at the end of the day. I don't know whether Petko will agree with me, but in Bulgaria this could never happen. All the events that we have them and we, we were organizing, we organized them for three hours before the lunch break. After the lunch break you end up with two or three people. So I really do want to believe that uh, actually it's, it's really so interesting, the topic and every, everything that um, uh, you're, you're still here because of it. I also think, again, that it's maybe a question of culture. Um, having said that, we have had <laughs> a civic engagement culture. Uh, having said that, I mean, um, I have been listening very carefully the entire day because we have very many uh, very interesting but very diverse and different interventions. So, um, I mean, the question all, all the time on the back of my mind was, okay, but what is, what is the lowest common denominator of everything that we are debating here? And how does it relate with this broad and maybe vague concept of European citizenship? And then... I have, to, I have to admit that now, a like couple of minutes before, I, I knew that I have to say some concluding words. Uh, it's in a way struck me a bit because I thought, okay, I think we, we can never succeed in making it work or fully tap the potential benefits and everything if we do not look at European citizenship as actually an ecosystem. It is an ecosystem. Uh, there are so many different levels and so many different dots with their uh, particularities that are not only related, uh, they're interdependent. Um, today we heard a lot and my understanding is that, okay, even if at the European level does everything perfect, it won't be enough if the member states do not do their job. And... Uh, we have witnessed a lot of examples that the European Commission, from time to time, comes with a very innovative proposal, which after that is watered down by the member states and, and the Council. 
and, and it is a reality. But but also, I mean, we've heard today that actually there are very important steps that have to be taken at local level. One of our colleagues in the first panel said, a mobile citizen has to be welcome when he moves to another country and, and have to be engaged if he want the, the, the European citizenship to work. Then there are so many also different aspects, starting from the free movement rights, to labor rights, to housing, to health care, which, which are also interrelated. Um, what is the most important thing besides the different components of every ecosystem? Uh, in my view, it's what connects all the, all the elements, the energy, the communication. And, and, and here I would say this is what we can maybe broadly call the civic engagement. Uh, young people and social entrepreneurship are part of the fuel of this energy that circulates in the ecosystem. So um, I know that it makes things rather complicated than simple at the end of the day, but, um, but I, I've never been convinced more than um, no matter what hat we are wearing, we are so interdependent with regard to our actions that the only way in which we can make it work is first if we work together and second if we really keep each other accountable and responsible. Thank you very much for being part of this exercise. The follow-up, of course, will be, we have, a, um, a re we have been recording uh, the, the broadcast and we'll have a video, we'll have a story telling, which Marta will make, we have a report and everything else. And um, we, uh, we will keep in touch through all possible channels. Um, now comes a bit more informal part of, of the day which is um, going through the exhibition, which illustrates different forms of actions and citizens' engagement by the partners of uh, the impact projects. We also have videos. So um, I don't know who exactly will be leading it. So it's the leader of the consortium, please. Thanks for me once again. It was a pleasure.